Would you please welcome from the National, Bryce Sesner. So, Bryce, we're not going to talk about the National at all. We're going to talk about all the other things you do as the hardest working man in, in show business, clearly. Tell me a little bit about, there might be lots of people in here who did music lessons when they were kids and when we're brought into that world of classical music in one way or another. What were your first memories of, I think it was the flute, the first, first of all, was it? What are your first memories of that kind of introduction to music? Was it a good experience or was it, you know? Um, my first memories of that are with my brother of just, um, our dad was a drummer in the 60s, a, a jazz trained drummer. And so there was his kit in the house and, um, and we were kind of fooling around with that. And I kind of, I think both of us were so curious about music that we would sort of, but didn't, couldn't find a way into it. Um, and, we're, and we didn't really have a, an understanding that we would grow up to be musicians. So originally when I got into sort of notated, like studying music formally, it was just to kind of unlock some of the mystery to, to if I could understand what's going on behind the music. And so that's- So you wanted to do this, you sort of were up for it. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was definitely, I played flute as a kid and, um, and got decently uh, okay at it uh, to the point that I could, you know, give a little recital on the flute. <laughs> yeah. And did you, and I know you moved on to piano a, a, as well, did, did you like the music that you were being introduced to at that age? You know, little bits of classical music, I guess. Did you like it? Um, I think I appreciated it, but it, I, I, my mind wasn't really opened to the possibility of what what that could bring until much later, I think. I think that I was more interested in kind of like the guitar playing of John Fahey or trying to figure out how Dwayne Allman played slide guitar. These kinds of things were like the, that was the complex music that I was interested in at the time. And it is, it is, it is complex music you're talking about there, even at an early age. But I guess a lot of young kids who are learning guitar, what they want to be is, I don't know, Jimmy Page, Angus Young, you know, um, Jimi Hendrix, I mean, there's many of them, guitar heroes as such. Did that ever appeal to you, that side of it? Um, that's a good question. I don't know why it didn't, um, but it never did. We, like, from the earliest, so when I switched from playing flute as a, as a you know, 12 year old to playing guitar as a 13 year old, we really quickly, uh, my sister had boyfriends in punk rock bands, she was three years older, and. And they would come around the house and like jam Minutemen or Firehose tunes with us. And like, you know, the, it was at the time when the Pixies or the Breeders were playing in, in Afghan wigs in Southern Ohio. And so we just, we didn't, we weren't interested in kind of virtuosic rock. Um, even though, you know, I learned some Led Zeppelin tunes. Um, I think probably for us, like the Velvet Underground was like, or Neil Young, that was the guitar music that we were playing. And you know, it's funny you mentioned the, the, the Velvet Underground. I mean, John Cale and people like that would have a similar trajectory as, as you and that, you know, classical music was behind everything that he subsequently subsequently did. But it's, it's interesting to me that you were at that age. I think most, most kids that I'm aware of, classical music was a kind of a drag to them, which they, they threw off at the age of 13, completely. And, and were glad to be out of it as such. And maybe come back in later years, but they wanted to shake that off and become rock stars, you know, or pretend rock stars. Yeah, I mean, when, once I got into high school, I was, um, I had gotten interested in playing classical guitar, and then I really did fall in love with the actual music, so like Spanish guitar music and playing Bach on the guitar, and and so I did that. We had a rock band in high school, and then I had a little Irish traditional music band with the bio biology teacher. Oh, here, hold up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, it, it, this was with no no formal plans to become a professional musician, but it was basically like what we could do. We had, there was a an Irish uh, our biology teacher was into playing you know reels on her on the on the fiddle, and so we would we would jam with her at lunchtime. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is this is breaking news. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't see that coming at all. That's where this, the the fast strumming comes yeah. from. Yeah. And <laughs> do you, but even at even at thirteen then were yourself and your brother playing guitar in a way that you were developing yourselves or did you have anything else to go on? I mean, who else was there was who, that you might have been inspired by in that regard? I mean, in those early days, we, 
there were these things, you know, like I said, listening to Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead, we couldn't figure out, that sounded to me like an Irish fiddler, you know, playing you know, guitars. How the hell does he do that? And that was part of the sort of quest that would begin then to figure music out, you know, in a way. But we, you know, we're like all teenagers in the, like, it was the time of Nirvana. It was the time of Sonic Youth. It was, that was what we were into. Um, you know, probably I would say Radiohead became a band that was important to us then um, in those days. But I think in terms of actual guitar players, once I was 18 and went to college, I used to go and stand at the front at gigs and just watch what was happening. And I did that enough to the point that I started to have confidence of, you know, seeing Lee Ronaldo play or seeing Ira from Yola Tengo or the people like that. That's who we were really into. Now, you went through... Um, a kind of a there's a sort of a route for a classical musician, isn't there? You know, you can do your exams, do your grades, you can go to college, you can study, you can become a professional musician, you can become a teacher. Was that something that that you thought about quite young? That this this is this is a road I'm going, definitely going to take. Yeah, I just I, I I ended up going to college and there was a really good music school and I kind of fell into the program there and was surrounded by all these really. So that's when the really kind of serious music started to happen. Um, so, you know, like a composer like David Lang was teaching there. Um, and, uh, and then in my early twenties, when I moved to New York, I got hired by Philip Glass to do a couple of tours playing his music. And then eventually Steve Reich when I think it was 23 or 24. And this is why the national was, was, you know, actually in the early days, that's how I was earning money. Uh, and then I, I was also teaching music at a high school in Manhattan. Um, when you're, when you're hired at that age by Philip Glass, and and Steve Reich, I'd imagine even more so. You must have had serious chops very early. I mean, those th that's th that's tough music to play, and Steve in particular is a pretty hard taskmaster, you know. Yeah, it was a weird. Basically, having grown up with classical music and playing chamber music in college, then I was one of a couple people in New York who was into electric guitar but could read. You know, could sit down with a. And that's why I got called to do that stuff, I think. And then it, eventually the music, what, what was kind of classical music out here and sort of a, in, a vague interest in Spanish guitar. And then I started to learn about Electric Co Counterpoint by Steve Reich, which is like a seminal yeah. uh, multiple electric guitar piece that is more of an influence, say, on Johnny Greenwood than Jimmy Page, yeah. I would say. Um, and so then the world started to combine in really yeah. fascinating ways for me. Um, where the elements of, say, Reich's language started to enter into the vocabulary that I share with my brother Aaron in our when we write in the National, for instance. And so it started to become a really interesting kind of place musically. Uh, Reich has been on this, this show with me a few times, and I always remember this thing he always says about when he was into music. He loved all this very old uh, periton and all this kind of music, and he, followed, and he loved Bach, and then he just skipped all the rest of it up as far as Stravinsky. So he left, you know, he's not he's not interested in Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't you, like rubato like if the tempo slows it, yeah. it, yeah, it so, drives him crazy. So did you yeah. did you keep up did you give up on or leave or lose interest in that part of the canon, you know, the Beethoven and Mozart and all the rest of it or do you still have an interest in that? No, I love Brahms, I love Mahler. Um I love a lot of sort of early 20th century Bartok, Stravinsky, um, then mid 20th century Ligeti, uh, Ludoslavsky, even you know, uh, Boulez and Berio, and uh, the, all those composers mean a lot to me. So I have I have a kind of um, very kind of musical scavenger approach to you know, especially for sounds like uh, you know composers who were very experimental in their approach to sound with instruments. I find that really fascinating. So I don't really have, and I love to go hear, you know, if you're gonna go hear an orchestra concert, it's great to hear them play Beethoven or hear them play Bruckner, you know, to hear them play great 19th century music is amazing. A lot of the, the, the later musicians that you mentioned there, it's it's all quite, and certainly the first time you hear it, quite difficult music. It's, it's sort of angular and complicated and not easy on the ear in ways that Mozart might be, for instance. Did you come across that music firstly when you were studying or, or did you find it? Because I don't know where else you're going to find that kind of music sometimes, you know? Um, yeah, I guess probably f my first encounter was in hearing the student recitals in school where you go and they'd be playing some crazy, you know, Berio, for those of you who are not classical musicians, is a... Uh, amazing Italian composer. He's kind of the, the, the Boulez of Italy. And he's fascinating because he was very interested in folk music. Um, and his, his output is also very political. 
Um, so he's just written some of the most powerful music of the 20th century, I think, and he's a good kind of gateway into that world. Maybe less, uh, sometimes Boulez can be a, a, a further leap in a way. Um, so his music I was definitely passionate about early on. And I don't think, I think part of the thing Steve Reich would say about someone like me is we don't, where he was fighting against kind of ideology about what's allowed in classical music. If you're a classically trained company, all these kind of very tiring, very boring, very overworked arguments, which are still going on, you know, actively today in most corners of the academic world. But um, now for a composer, it's quite, quite freeing to think that, you know, you can present your chamber music on a rock festival and maybe people will listen. Well, I suppose these guys like Philip Glass and Steve Rice in particular have a lot to be, we've a lot to thank them for, for opening that up. I mean, they, they brought their music into the wrong places to play it, you know, and Bo Bowie turns up and Eno turns up and, you know, it, it changed everything, didn't it, really? Yeah, or like, you know, people think of um, maybe Philip and Steve Rice as classical, but to, to us, grow, you know, being in New York in the late 90s, early 2000s, like, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, Patti Smith, who played last night, you know, Michael Stipe from R.E.M., uh, David Byrne, um, you know, these are the people that, the, the Laurie Anderson, these are, they're, they're part of the same community, actually, of, of just really brilliant renegade artists who kind of had a, you know, opened up all kinds of creative territory for people in the future, I think. Yeah. And when you got interested in, in, in that kind of music, and I know there's no word for it, uh, one specific word for it, but did you find yourself um, not alone, but getting into a smaller group of people as such? You know, I mean, were you? Did you have many friends or pals who were also into it? I guess fellow students, I suppose. But, but you know, it's kind of it's still kind of rarefied, isn't it? I mean, it's surprising now the way that maybe popular music has moved back. I think with Spotify and kind of. Um, people starting to write almost like they used to write for a radio format to kind of appeal to a massive streaming culture. Um, but it, there was a, a moment in the early 2000s when a lot of this stuff sort of, you know, bands like Animal Collective and Grizzly Bear and my friend Sufjan Stevens and my friend Richard Reed Perry from Market Fire and then composers, um, you know, all kinds of interesting composers, especially in the more electronic world or some or someone like Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead where it, Actually, it felt like there was a kind of creative currents that were, you know, doubling over and crossing in ways that weren't just watering it down, that were actually kind of creating new forms of music that I think is still very much, you know, there are kids, like 18-year-old kids out there with sequences who are doing far more complex kinds of music than what you hear being written at, in, a, in a conservatory. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you were in the middle of all this world, did it occur to you ever to do the reverse of what I was talking about earlier, you know, the classical kid throwing it away to become a rock star. Did you ever think, well, I don't really want to be in a in a rock band. This is this is too rich, too much. I, I want to get into this world completely. And a, and maybe a rock band won't satisfy my musical uh, the ideas way I anymore. Yeah, the way I describe that is the the band is a very personal. The band is my family, um, literally. You know, my brother Aaron. Um, We've been playing with Brian Devendorf, the drummer, since we were 13, 14. We've had bands with him. So it's like, it's family. You know, maybe the, the concert contemporary music world for me is kind of like adventure into like an unknown sort of dark and scary forest or something. It's, it is a, it's a thorny place. It's also a very poetic space where I can kind of fully go down whatever rabbit hole I feel like, you know, where, you know, um, asking Matt to sing over my 30-minute orchestral piece is probably not a good idea, but <laughs> but yeah, I think they're, they've always coexisted for me, so I don't know what I would do without... I mean, I, obviously, as we get older, it starts, you know, th the question starts to arise of, like, how long are we going to do this? And then, and it's a scary thing to not imagine having both sides of my life. Because, you know, I, I, you know if you read a press article about you, the easy thing to say is that you're le you lead some kind of a Jekyll and Hyde existence or a double life, and it's not that. It's the same, it's the same life, isn't it? It really is the same life, and the most interesting sides of it are when I'm not thinking about how to behave. It's like, do you really put on a different set of clothes if you show up at someone's house for dinner, or, or the, you know, it's like, I'm the same person. And I think John Cale is a good example of that, or, you know, or even someone like, if you really talk to someone like Lee Ronaldo from Sonic Youth, he's, his creative imagination is really quite diverse, the things he's interested in. 
Yeah. And also, I, I think it's quite interesting that someone who, in terms of the academic music he'd studied and all the rest of it, went down a route that's qu quite relatively rarefied. And I would expect you don't expect huge audiences for that kind of music. Maybe in New York you do, if there's Ligeti or Steve or any of that. In New York you would, I guess. Whereas, you know, pop music, for want of a better word, is, a, is largely a commercial enterprise and all sorts of success is possible. And you have been extremely successful in, in, in that regard, you know? There's that strange thing about, you know, being very successful in a commercial arena and also operating successfully in an arena which I guess is not that commercial. <laughs> and certainly those productions must be very expensive to stage and operas and ballets and orchestras and chamber music and all the rest of it. So it's an interesting thing that you're, you're li you, in that sense, you're living in two different worlds. The I'm we're supposed to narrow it down. Are there different demands on you within each of those worlds in terms of how you promote what you're doing, how you tour what you're doing, how you, how you go about your business as such? I mean, I think there would be. Um, maybe if I did it to the point, if I was really pushing myself to be the most successful in either space or something, but I don't. You know, the national, we don't really compromise. Our label's always kind of scratching their head because we don't. You know, we we haven't written the, you know, the massive global pop hit they might have wanted. Although I think they support us no matter what. H have, you, yeah. have you tried? Um, have you sat down and, you know, because there's a method to a lot of these global hits, isn't there? Well, now that it's become an algorithm, we can yeah. certainly, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Actually, and there, that could be the perfect marriage we, of we could do it my now. interest in Darmstadt and uh, <laughs> pop music is just algorithmic uh, <laughs> national. That's a good idea. Yeah, um, the. Well, Steve, I mentioned Steve Reich a few times. If you don't know Steve Reich, you should check out his music. A very influential composer. Um, at the time it came out, everybody thought he was mad, thought the music was terrible, etc., etc. Now that we've grown up with electronic and dance music and all that, it doesn't sound quite as strange as it used to. But I think for you, he would have been a particular influence, I guess. But, but that would also be personally. Um, yeah, so Steve Reich is, um, I mean, I think that more than half of the projects I've worked on, he's somehow, he's kind of decided to kind of help, you know, just encourage me and be a very, he, he loves the national. He's even, you know, listened to the records before they come out um, and send his feedback. You know, he's, he's just an amazing, very kind of Buddha-like presence. Um, and um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to work with him on a piece called uh, Two by Five that he, um, I recorded for him, I think, in 2004 or five, so quite early. And it's just like beyond virtuosic, difficult piece of music that we, you know, in the studio. And so it was just a really amazing experience to kind of get inside someone's um, someone's head like that. I always say that like when I'm, when I'm 80, you know, probably having worked with Steve Reich and having met Obama will be the sort of the two things I remember <laughs> from that period. He, yeah. he calls out his rock album. The yeah. Two times five mm -hmm. or two by five record. Um, what is it like? I'll, I'll not talk with Steve Rice again for just one more one more question on Steve Rice. I've seen him in rehearsal with musicians, and it's really tough going, you know, because some musicians do, uh, who don't know his aesthetic 100% will just rock up and start playing. Uh, and if you start playing, you know, guitar counterpoint, just playing it, he said, "No, no, that's not how you play it." And there's a long time spent in showing you exactly how it gets played. How do you find, you know, that kind of rigor? Compared to, I, s I guess, a sense of more freedom playing with playing with the national, playing playing in a rock scenario where you can, f I guess, be a bit looser. I mean, that's again, I think, part of the myth about these things is I actually find, um, in my experience of playing, you know, rock music, I had recently worked, did some arranging for Paul Simon, and Paul Simon and Steve Reich were very similar, in a way, the kind of rigor they have about their music or say working, you know, playing in Sufjan Stevens band, the kind of feedback you get from him, which can be just brutal. You know, I mean, I think that yeah, it's people think they called Steve a kind of bull in a china shop, but he's always been really lovely to me. Yeah. Oh, as soon as the concert's happening, it's, it's, all, it's brilliant, sweetness and light, yeah. But it's, it's true what you're saying. I mean, thinking of Radiohead, for instance, and you know, I know their music is complicated, but if you watch uh, Colin Greenwood, the, the bass player, Poor guy standing in the back counting the whole time. He's like one, two, three. You know, it's it's like there's huge pressure on people to concentrate. It's not like a jam, you know. Yeah, and actually, I, I recently was lucky enough to to get to work with Tom York, sort of share musical space with him, and he, 
again, it's, it's, you know, while he's not a classical composer in a formal sense, the way he approaches music is just unbelievably specific and, and actually kind of away from what you might think of the kind of metered pulsing electronic music. He was actually much more kind of um, encouraging kind of freedom in the, in the, in, in a way, some, something you might associate more with like, you know, those, these piano pieces he had composed that he was talking more about like the kind of rubato and speeding up and slowing down in these ways that, but he was very, that's always very enlightening for me to see someone who's coming from the space that he's coming in as one of the you know most brilliant musicians of the, you know, last while anyway. Um, and the way that his mind has shaped music is fascinating to, to understand. Of course, uh, and and you know the music, the music of the national too is, and I think it's a word I heard you use once, is detailed. You know, detail is is there. Do you know that, and and that's that's rigor. That involves all that rigor and training. You know, but we're not going to talk about the national at all. We're not yeah, we're just detail. Yeah, we we hide things under rocks and see if people <laughs> find them. Yeah. Um, the the open mind the open mindedness of some of the people you've mentioned. Like Philip Glass and Steve Reich and yourselves and all those all that crowd of people who are you're all in the same orbit and there's so many of you now. I think that has to be encouraged, doesn't it? That open mindedness. Because I think classical music people are you know, it might be a myth, but the they seem to be quite sniffy about other forms of music. But in my experience, rock fans are the worst of all, you know, they can be really snobbish. But you know, I would never listen to jazz, I would never listen to classical music. So a bit of open mindedness would go a long way, I think. I think so. I think it'd be uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should encourage it. We should encourage it here. Um, some of the particular projects that you're involved in, and this, I'm conscious of this because your biography is is like chock a block with stuff that you've done. Are you are you even conscious yourself of how much you have done? It's extraordinary. Occasionally, I feel like, oh, is it? Do I need a break? But then I'm only 40, 43, so I think, well, I haven't even yeah, started yet. So yeah. But it almost looks as if you, you, you are taking on commissions before you finish the one you're already on or something like that. It is, it's just there's so much. And does that put a strain on, well, you know, actually, Bryce, we're, we're touring next month, or we've got a gig next week, or we're making a record? And um, I tend to schedule it so the the band makes an album, we tour for a year, and then we take a three-year break. Yeah. This time, we were supposed to take a three-year break, but it ended up being eight months. So <laughs> it's been a tricky year, yeah. So are you at the stage um, wh where you find it hard to resist a challenge musically? You know, if you're asked to write a ballet or you're asked to do a chamber piece or you're an opera, whatever it is, you, you want to do it, don't you, Ron? I have to admit, I may have just turned a corner into a new kind of space where I, I'm quite skeptical of um, when I get asked to do something, I kind of look at it like, oh, because because it is so much work. Um, and so I need to I need to have a good idea usually. So I think I um, I'll kind of spend some time thinking about it. And if something comes to me like because once you have an idea, then the piece kind of writes itself. What's very hard is when you've agreed to do something. It's like uh, you've agreed to create a little house on the site of this tent or something but you have no idea what it's supposed to look like and then you spend six months stressing out about that it, so it's it can it, it once you have some like a an idea it's a very fun and empowering process and, and how how much do you road test an idea to know that it's going to actually survive you know that you're going to get what you need out of it because they're very they're often very conceptual things you know like quilting you know something like that where you went off and studied quilting i mean Seems like a good idea, but you don't know at the start, do you, that this will produce enough material? I mean, I have to admit that I've been lucky that people keep asking me to do things. So just like the, as we said, we wouldn't talk about the national, but it's actually again pretty similar that we slowly developed into, say, the band that will play later tonight on stage. Now that we've played hundreds of festivals, we kind of know how to write a set list. Um, and similarly for my, you know, quilting is an or orchestral piece I wrote for the Los Angeles Philharmonic like five years ago. And um, and it was a really, I love the piece. And it was written for Gustavo Dudamel, who's probably the world's most famous virtuosic conductor. But I wrote it at the tempo marking is quarter note equals 85 the whole time, <laughs> which is not very fast. And so you said so I got I sat there in rehearsal and I, I realized it when he was up there on stage conducting it the first time. That's you know, and it has fast passages, but he's there, kind of in this steady tempo. And I thought, oh, I could have, 
given him more to do. You know, that was it was a kind of amazing learning experience. Because when you're doing that, it's, it's only occurred to me more recently, you have to know everything, don't you? Because you could write a piece for a singer which is physically impossible to sing, things like that. Or, you know, there's no, there's no violinist on earth who could play what you've just written for them or something like that. The important is, thing is just to have friends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, have friends who who will just tell you, I have friends who are just brutal and will say that is absolutely impossible. And I've, I've, I have written enough music now that I know mostly what is, what is, um, I like to write up to the edge of virtuosity where you're really making people play, but they're not angry at you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the friends then. Collaboration. It seems to be a, you know, all, uh, you know, musician collaborator. It, the collaborator part seems to be as important to you as musician and composer, and indeed curator. And we talk about that at the end because I want to mention Sounds of Safe Harbor. But collaboration again, it's it sounds like a joy if you have the friends you have to go and work with them. I mean, I can't think of anything better. But then, you know, mu you know, ultimately you're on your own writing music, so there's a bit of trade there, I guess. I mean, it's a, again having the best of both worlds, and maybe I'm I. I'm I'm um, very spoiled, but basically, yeah. I mean, being born a twin and making music with my brother, we're kind of we are collaborators first. We do best in that environment, and then as a in a collaborative band where you're always working with five musicians, or actually in the national, it's many more than that because of the number of people on the records, and and so it's really healthy to have a space you can go to where you really have to just finish your sentences, you know, finish your thought, and that's kind of what composition is for me. But even in, in composition, I mean, that it's a very lonely process, actually, to write a, especially a big piece. I recently wrote a 80-minute kind of small opera for, that was a, a very um, challenging and kind of uh, when, uh, intense process. And, um, and to, to give kind of birth to that alone and then take it to the musicians, that's when it gets exciting. And that's the collaboration, basically. And to have a, the, the best pieces that I've written are where I have like a, a relationship with the, with the musician. And can you give us some idea what it feels like? You know, you've written a, an 80 minute long, as you put it, small opera. I'm sure it would take nobody, very few people could do that and, and, and continue on. What it feels like for that to be translated then before your eyes into something else, or to hear your music suddenly. I'd say when Dudamel starts conducting, it, it, it takes up a new, moves up a gear somehow. What's, what's it like to see your notes, your dots on the page be transformed by other people like that? Um, it's either uh, <laughs> beyond frightening, terrifying, where you're just and awkward and you're kind of uncomfortable in your seat, which is about you know, 60% of the time um, until it becomes, you know, maybe the musicians learn it and it develops. Or it's, it's if it's really come together, it can be so kind of powerful that I immediately dissociate the music from myself. And I think, you know, the piece is not mine anymore. It's become something entirely different. It's usually because of the musicians playing it are so brilliant. There's certain musicians I work with, you give them two notes and they just make the most beautiful things with it and it's really I've just sort of and I think that's maybe what John Cage was interested in when he was always talking about kind of removing himself from the music to kind of dissociate the author yeah. from these sounds and I think that that is that feeling of like you've created something and it's no longer yours and it has a life um, and it can be played all over the world by people you don't know necessarily yeah. that is a really beautiful yeah. feeling and 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 yeah, and you don't even may not even know what's happening. Somebody could be playing your music somewhere, you know. So yeah, it, has, it takes on a life of its own. The the idea of curating is is is, is different, I guess, from collaboration. But it, and it would involve some of that too. But what's the attraction in curation? Because in a sense, that sounds like being a producer of some sort. You know, producing an event, which sounds like uh, a lot of a lot of phone calls and faxes, or what if they use faxes anymore? Phone calls, emails. And and head wreck, you know, stuff that's not necessarily creative, but you the curation side of thing. What appeals to you in, in that? Um, I I got involved in I started a music festival in Cincinnati, Ohio, in our hometown called Music Now in two thousand five or six, and it was purely actually just out of a this kind of space we're talking about of music that maybe doesn't quite fit in a classical concert hall and maybe doesn't quite fit played in front of twenty thousand people in a in a muddy field um, and not having a lot of spaces for that to to exist and for those musicians to kind of 
um, collaborate and work and, and maybe test out ideas with a, without the pressure that you have in certain kind of in Carnegie Hall in New York or something where everything is just under a magnifying um, glass. So I think um, the curating for me was actually more about um, you know collaboration and encouraging artists to come together and at a time when now there's many I think these things have especially in America in, in New York anyway there's a lot of festival environments that are very much um, inspired by the same ideas but I think at the time I got into it because I was just there was literally nowhere to play this music and sounds from a safe harbor the connection with Ireland well you've been here a lot uh, over the years you've probably been here at times we haven't even known you were here if you know what I mean definitely yeah um, sounds from a safe harbor that's coming up in September um, can you tell us anything about who's going to be there or what's what's in store I mean I can tell you um, two events that I'm involved in that I'm really excited about. One is a, a tribute to the the amazing Canadian singer Lassa De Sella, who passed away from breast cancer about, I think, 12 years ago now. And um, out of a residency that we did last summer with some artists, including Leslie Feist, um, we brought together um, a band of about eight people and different singers and, and, and covered some of those songs. And just they were brought to life in a way that felt so inspiring. It's music that I've loved for a very long time and have listened to kind of obsessively. It turned out that Andrew Barr, who's from the Barr Brothers, is was scheduled to to be the drummer on the session, and he was actually the last drummer in Lassa's band. And so we're do, we're staging a kind of bigger version of that uh, as a premiere at Sounds from the Safe Harbor, and that that's I'm really excited about. And then the project I mentioned with Tom York, where he wrote um, some piano music for the French pianist Katia Marielle Lebec, with whom I have a my most recent. Yeah album called El Chan, which is a concerto that I, double concerto I wrote for them. We were playing a bit of that before, yeah. uh, before the guys came um, out. So we're performing that as well in the Opera House um, with Tom's music and some music that I wrote. And um, th yeah, I'm really excited about all that. But there's, there's you know, Mary Hickson is really the, the genius behind Sounds from a Safe Harbor. And we, um, we met in Cork probably five or six years ago. And she was talking about just presenting some of my music at the Opera House where she was director at the time. And and it quickly kind of snowballed into a citywide event involving hundreds of artists and 30,000 people or something. So yeah, it's been a really fun ride doing that. You see, one of, the, one of the things I think is great about hearing you talk about music is that, and I wish I'd heard someone like you talk about music when I was 13 or 14, because I think when you hear someone in a band that you like, for me it would have been Elvis Costello or Van Morrison or somebody, name checking other people. And it gives you permission, in a sense, as a kid to go and check them. You probably did the same thing when you heard. But I think when you, when when people hear you talk about, you know, Ligeti or Steve Reich or something, I think people will go and and, and check those people out. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and in that regard, though, if you were to if you were to curate the festival of your dreams, let's say, what what say I don't know five people would you uh, would you have living or dead? Living or dead. Oh wow. Festival of my dreams. That was that's putting me on the spot. Well, I would definitely want um, Monteverdi there, who is a if you don't know a 16th century Italian madrigal composer, <laughs> kind of invented opera. Um, that would be John Cage would have to come. Patti Smith would be there in multiple forms. Um, <laughs> yeah, then I have to I have to think about that. But yeah, um, well you've got. A Three minutes to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would, I would want... That's three. You've, you've given me three, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. We'd have to have Steve Reich collaborate yeah. with Beethoven. Yeah. To, to, that to settle that just score. Just for a bit of... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Steve Reich, Beethoven, yeah. Monteverdi, Patti Smith. Who was the other one? John Cage. John Cage. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, I'd stand in line for that one. Yeah. I really would. Bryce... Uh, one other question I want to ask you, the Enda Walsh project, just I think it would be particular interest to the audience here, you're, what are you doing with Enda? Or um, can you tell us about that? Maybe not. I don't know that Enda wants me to reveal That's the right. subject, but Enda Walsh, who is uh, one of Ireland's great playwrights and writers and a beautiful, amazing person, uh, we are working on, a, on, a, on an opera together, so that, th that hopefully will happen. <laughs> yeah. You see, the casual thing of we're working on an opera together. How do you, how do you learn to write an opera? Or do you, do you just say yes and start? Just going to do it with Enda, who's written a couple of good ones. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bryce Desner.
And uh, just before we go, we're going to have another song from Junior Brother. to see me revealing his bare underarms watching the moon from a lake reflection ruined by swans sizzling their movement then gone for better views of the winds this feeling reminds me of the back of my This feeling reminds me of the back of a Sing to the click of a quickening heel Sure nobody can take a fella's company from himself Surely From the wars last week, happy and returning, turned again for sight of home. I have courage, but I know there's a pit in me as well. It's the scared soldier has his own drenched down this feeling reminds me of the back of my this feeling reminds me of the back of my sing to the click of a quickening heels yeah nobody can take a fella's company from him So nobody can take a fella's company from himself. So nobody can take a fella's company from himself. So nobody can take a fella's company from himself. 
Turn your brother. Turn your brother. Ladies and gentlemen, turn your brother. Ladies and gentlemen, turn your brother. Bryce Desner, thanks for coming. Thank you.